All right. Sweet. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is the penultimate edition of Friday the 40th, if you can believe it. Our year-long look at the Friday the 13th franchise. And uh, I'm joined once again by Lee Showquist of Chicago Film and Peter M. Brackey, the author of, I'm going to do it again, I'm bringing up the book, Crystal Lake Memories, <laughs> The Complete History of Friday the 13th. Um, now, I am kind of, uh, I'm taking the other side on this one, just so there's some representation <coughs> of the conflicts, because I'm usually wearing the uh, the Camp Crystal Lake shirt, but today I'm wearing the Nightmare on <laughs> Elm Street, you know, got a little Freddy going on, um, it's because we are looking at Traitor. Freddy, yeah, I, look, I didn't say I'm endorsing, I just say I'm <laughs> representing. Um, <laughs> there are fine creatures on both sides, as someone once said. Um, but no, uh, <laughs> political humor. This is election, post-election season after all. Yes. Yeah. Jesus. Anyway, um, but so we're talking about Freddy versus Jason, uh, 2003's Freddy versus Jason, which is technically a Friday the 13th movie and technically a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. But honestly, I hadn't watched this thing in, in a long time before I put it on uh, late last week. And I think it was these conversations we've been having about the direction the Friday the 13th series in particular has taken over the last several films, getting away from the horror and getting into some like goofy realms that I kind of, not that I was ever in love with Freddy versus Jason, but I don't know that I'm much of a fan anymore. I, I'm curious to see what you guys think of the movie, thought of it in 2003 when you first saw it, what you think of it now, and then we can kind of get into the nitty gritty of it. So Lee, why don't you kick it off? Okay, I mean, I, I saw the movie once um, in, in 2003 and then I just uh, kind of put it away and I, I never really saw it again. And and um, this was what I said uh, when we talked about um, uh, uh, Jason X, if you remember that it was just kind of a, a one-timer for me, not um, one of the, the seminal movies in the, the series that I would return to like we 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 did uh, between uh, the first and the fifth. Uh, so so for, for me to see it now, it was sort of just uh, seeing it again. Uh, like I hadn't, um, you know, I didn't have any um, a notion of it. And, and to be honest with you, um, here's how I uh, felt about it. I thought like, you know, for me, the bar has been uh, so low in the last several films that that this movie kind of delighted me in a way. I thought it was uh, was was better um, in, in some regards than the the other ones, and I I don't know exactly why that is, uh, and I think it's a combination of a bunch of things that accidentally came together. Like I and, and I I could just say for me. Um, I think visually it's uh, better uh, in a way the 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 um, the look and feel of the movie the use of primary colors I mean I think it's it's a well composed and well shot movie um, and and stylish you know, frankly um, and I like some of the actors in the movie which is usually one of my my main beefs uh, in the in the last several which is that I just uh, didn't care about anybody or or didn't didn't like them and so in this case I I did like uh, several of them. Uh, a couple of them quite a bit. And so, so that made a difference for me. And maybe um, the fact that um, the conceptually, uh, th this was uh, going a little bit out on a limb and trying to do something that was um, um, kind of fun in a way, whether they was fully realized or not to me was just, it took it a little into a little bit of a different realm and engaged me a little more. So, so I, I felt kind of positive about the movie, but I, I, I really say, you know, with a caveat that, I mean, look, I mean, that's because successively we've seen some pretty bad movies. So, so this is for me like an uptick, uh, but I, I, I just want to say I liked Kelly Rowland a lot and, and she kind of <laughs> delivered the movie for me, <laughs> which is not a reason to recommend the movie, but, but nonetheless, I, I thought it was fun. Cool. Yeah. All right, Peter, how about you? Yeah. Well, you know, gosh, it, it was weird preparing for this just remembering back because i think like you lee and me like i didn't have like big expectations like by that point you know i knew this was like a matchup kind of hoot event movie that's meant for like a big mainstream audience the yeah. whole point of this movie is to get two characters to fight and it's gonna be like a wrestling match so you know and then doing i'd done so much research for the book leading up to it they're talking with the other screenwriters and it's like yeah you think about it like okay, oh, Freddy versus Jason, that'll be great, you know? But then, okay, well, Freddy and Jason can't be the heroes. Jason doesn't even talk. They're, they can't be the main characters. So you have to try to engineer some crazy way to get these two people to fight while like real human characters are kind of running around them. Like when you think about it dramatically, there's really no way to do this movie where the human characters don't just feel like you know, exposition to set up the big battle at the end. So I'm like, I'm just going to go in and look at this. I'm going to judge this movie on that last 20 minutes when they're fighting. Cause that's really what the movie is about. So 
you know, on that level, it was well made, well shot. Um, you know, it's fun. It's probably as good of a movie like this could be. Um, it had some good kills. The bed kill was pretty fun. Um, I cannot tell you until I watched it again. I couldn't tell you the plot. I, I vaguely remember there was like something with Monica Kina and some sort of character backstory story and something with dreams or something but like but none of that matters you know that's not what this is about so um but like you lee like it's not one i've put on to watch for fun like it's not like the first four were you know their comfort food this is was like a one-off kind of uh, you know event thing that i saw once and never really thought about ever again in my life you know <laughs> yeah I, mean, I, I want to say to your your point about um, following it or know, knowing the story I mean I, I've seen it three times in the last couple of days yeah uh, and I, I'm going to tell you like I still um I can't tell you exactly what's yeah, yeah. what's going on in it or <laughs> why, why they're in the places they are but I, I can yeah. tell you that there are certain scenes in the movie that I really enjoyed like the mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation scene mm -hmm. which I I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I thought the visuals and the, the scene out in the, the rave mm -hmm. uh, out in the uh, cornfield was cool with the, the, the stream of fire uh, kind of going through the cornfield and, and things like that. So I, I just sort of, um, you know, yeah, I mean, I thought it was enjoyable in some ways. So, yeah. 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 And that's, and I think it is a cool movie and, you know, I, maybe we just need to be content with that but i think about i've been thinking about the roots of these franchises because that's kind of what we've been talking about uh, the last few episodes i mean these start off as genuine like horror movies so i guess when you get to the point where it's freddy versus jason i guess the question i'm putting to you is is it possible to have a scary iteration of this premise now at the beginning of the year you know five thousand years ago i read a, another book about the several different drafts of the screenplay called yes. slash of the titans have you read this peter um, yeah i i've I, most parts of it yeah okay now it goes through i mean it's a few hundred pages long yeah. or a couple and it goes through all of the different drafts of this because this thing goes back decades of you know the various yeah. companies and writers trying to put together a film with these characters and a lot of the premises are weird some of which i think might have been successful some of which mm -hmm. i think definitely would not have been you know, there, there's hopeless, like there was the cult, the, the Fred heads, uh, the people who devoted to Freddy Krueger and, um, you know, the the match involving like with Pinhead making a cameo and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Freddy versus Jason versus Ash, they put into a comic book later. But even that is sort of an indication that we're just going to turn this into almost a literal comic book. You know, you've got Ash from the Evil Dead with his shotgun and his you know, chainsaw and bring back like Tommy Jarvis and some of the other survivors from the other series. It's a fun idea, but, you know, is there any way that this could work as a horror movie? What do you guys think? I mean, for me, no, because I, I, I think they, um, you know, as we always say, I mean, the, the villains have been uh, vaulted out into the pop culture. And so they're not, you know, there's just no attempt to really make them scary or to build um, uh, real suspense sequences around them. So, so I, I, you know, and that's just me. I mean, maybe there are, are people who feel otherwise um, when, when they see these, but, but to me, they're just, we're too familiar with those uh, characters. They, they kind of have been brought out of the shadows to a certain degree. And so they're just not, um, you know, they just, they can't generate that, that type of suspense. And I think the direct uh, for the most part don't don't really use them in that way or or work to generate any suspense they just um make them into personas and so i, I still think though that the character of, of freddy krueger because the the kind of profane um uh, viciousness that uh, robert england uh, displays in is a, a, a scary character um but i think he'd he'd um, be scarier and kill a lot more people if he talk a little bit less you know so yeah <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely there when we do get to see a bit of that dichotomy in the opening flashback. I think the setup of this film is really great where it's Freddy kind of in hell narrating his big plot to to break out of, you know, <laughs> eternal jail. Uh, and we get to see, you know, Freddy Krueger when he was a man, you know, getting lynched by the the people of Springwood and, and set on fire and everything. But you do get to see him as the creepy, you know, child molesting killer contrasted with the wisecracking you know jovial guy like i was kind of thinking when exactly did this break happen <laughs> i know there was mm -hmm. a dividing line in the movies kind of but uh, at what point did he just become wacky uh, in in freddy krueger's journey 
Um, but and then, then they kind of set up the you know who is Jason, what is Jason. I like the idea of. I almost wanted to see the movie that Freddie was describing, where he was searching the bowels of hell for the perfect <laughs> assassin puppet to send up to to help him uh, make people afraid of him again. The premise, I think, of this this film is strong. I just don't know if the the wrestling kind of motif that that Ronnie Yu you know imposes onto the movie is effective beyond an opening weekend kind of sensation, which may be why we haven't really gone back to revisit over the years. It's I remember in 2003 uh, seeing the teaser poster and being like, oh, my God, it's happening. And then going opening night, packed theater, friends all losing our minds. It was like going to a wrestling event. But I remember also having been in the theater to see the original Friday the 13th during one of the anniversaries. And the atmosphere was similarly electric, but we were all there to be scared. It's not like a Monty Python thing where you're shouting out the lines, like laughing and stuff. People were just genuinely intense for something that was mm -hmm. at that time, 30 years old. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, it's, that's what it was just engineered to do. It was engineered to be, sort of, I thought it was like a sort of a payoff or a, a payoff movie for fans. Like, you know, you've both, you know, been so loyal to these series. We're going to give you your kind of big wrestling mashup. We're going to give you kind of greatest hits moments. There's Freddie gets his kills and Jason gets his good kills. And then you get the big battle. It's not, it's not about any sort of story that you're supposed to be really, I guess the idea of Freddie, you know, getting Jason to be his puppet, if that was done really dark and serious where Freddie was scary again, but even that it's kind of hard to, you know, wrap your mind around. Okay. So Freddie's in hell and he's going to pick Jason. It's just such a goofy, I and mean, the whole concept of a big wrestling, Freddy versus Jason, I mean, just inherently. I remember in the theater, they showed the trailer, we had some other movie. I mean, all the fans, I mean, all the people in the theater who weren't even Freddy or Nightmare fans, everyone was cheering because it's such a, I mean, anyone who hears that title is, sounds like, oh, wait, what a fun idea. Like, even if you're not, I mean, I went with people who maybe saw one of the movies each. They remember Freddy from years ago and they had a good time because it was kind of made for, the mainstream i think you know what i mean it wasn't yeah. yeah a serious attempt to tell the continuation of the freddie and jason story i didn't, I didn't get that but yeah and there, there are some nice easter eggs like i'm glad they brought back uh hypnosil like from nightmare on elm street uh, mm -hmm. dream warriors um you know these little touches you do get the feeling that it was uh shannon and swift i think who wrote mm -hmm. the the this screenplay the one that actually made it to theaters yeah. uh and you could tell that they had really done the homework and wanted to make something was uh crowd pleasing i don't mean that in a derogatory way um there were some iffy moments like I know it's kind of a controversy over the uh, is Jason really afraid of water? Um, I think it was in maybe the documentary of uh, Crystal Lake Memories where they kind of debunked uh, that idea. Like he wasn't afraid of water. It was just something like it was something that he was freaked out by because that's kind of how he drowned. So he was not quite prepared for it because we have seen Jason swim or go underwater to kill people in mm -hmm. other films. Yeah, yeah um, no problem. Right, but it's also it's just a cool visual. Anyway, to your point, Lee, there's a lot of style uh, in this film. So even if there's stuff that doesn't make sense, even if it's if it's gorgeous, if it's weird and fun to look at, we kind of let some things slide. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know we we have to remember that the film is a visual medium, of course, and and there, you know it's, when you have someone who who applies um, artistry or integrity to a movie like this um, that could could get by without um, the the level of uh, artistry behind it and has gotten by uh, without it um, in the past, we have to give some some credit where due. So so it, it's been a very long time since we would think back to a movie in this series where we could call uh, back or call out specific shots that we liked um, because. For the most part, we, we talk about the makeup or we talk about whatever the, the creative twist is or otherwise, but but from a um, um, uh, point of view of cinema in this movie, I mean, there are some incredibly beautifully mounted sequences. There are, um, you know, in this beautifully blue bathed uh, back of the van where the, as I mentioned earlier, the um, resuscitation scene takes place. And earlier in the, the movie, there's a scene between uh, Jason Ritter um, and, and I'm, his name is escaping me at the moment where they're in the back of the van. There's a, a, another one that's bathed in green. I thought the combinations of blues and blues mm -hmm. and oranges on the dock at the, um, uh, in the final sequence of the movie was beautiful. And, and so I think there is a level of um, artistry in the movie. Now, when you listen to um, uh, Ronnie, you talk about it. I mean, there, there is something very comical about it because um, as they talk about some of the 
um, have um, origins or are paying homage to other places like they'll, they'll say this is the Hitchcock shot or this is the Scorsese shot or <laughs> you know and I, I'm only scratching the surface because it's kind of a comical um, a commentary the number of callbacks to classic movies that you, you never would have thought were were uh, you know even thought about in a movie like this but but I, I love to hear that stuff and so as, as he talks about how this is kind of a, a movie like Aliens or or otherwise um, you know it's kind of fun and I think there's um, um you know, an engine of artistry behind this movie and as, as ridiculous as it is um, at, at times. I mean, there's some kind of new life breathed into it. And I would just call it more of a Nightmare on Elm Street movie than a, a Friday the 13th movie, simply because, um, I mean, uh, Freddy as a character just dominates every moment that he's in, in a way that Jason never really can because because he's uh, stoic uh, in a way, if that's the right word, or he just is, doesn't say much. And so as much effort that goes into making his eyes more lively or, or recasting the role, which will we can probably talk about uh, here as well. Um, he'll never be able to match up to the dynamism that Robert Englund has in the movie. And, and so Robert Englund kind of owns this movie and it feels to me more like a, a Nightmare on Elm Street movie with uh, you know Jason as, as part of that whole nightmarish world than it does a, a Friday the 13th movie. So, but but I, I thought it was entertaining. That's, yeah. that's an interesting point you make there because it does feel very Nightmare on Elm Street throughout the entire thing. I wonder if that's because through a lot of it, it's Freddy sort of pulling the strings now at the end when monica kina pulls him out into the real world i feel like that's when it becomes even though it's that kind of a warner brothers cartoon feel to it i feel like that's where it becomes more of a friday the 13th film just in terms of the the gore because when freddie and jason are hacking the crap out of each other there's so much <laughs> blood and viscera everywhere that i don't remember except for maybe the johnny depp bed scene in, in the original elm street uh that that much you know violence going on um now to your uh, something you just brought up uh ken kurtzinger cast as Jason after Kane Hodder had been, you know, had sort of redefined the role uh, for a generation with the last several Friday films. There's a big controversy, like bring Kane back, but you know, the studios or whoever decided that they wanted someone, I guess the, the, the main reason was they wanted someone who was taller in stature mm -hmm. that could look good against England as the smaller Freddy Krueger. My question is, couldn't they have just done that with like camera angles and apple carts or you know or apple crates or something? Like, did did you guys feel that Kurtzinger brought something to the role that Hotter couldn't have, or do you feel like anybody could have played this part? Well, that's a tough. I mean, um, I mean, Ken definitely is a big, pretty imposing guy. Jason looks he has a different kind of silhouette in this movie than Kane does. Um, you know, it really came down to two or three executives at New Line just felt like they wanted to really make the movie new and put their own stamp on it. I know there was uh, one producer who, a couple, they just didn't feel like the other Friday teams were really particularly well made. They wanted to get away from that aesthetic. So it was a mix of those things. I mean, no one personally didn't like Kane, um, mm -hmm. from what I was told. Um, so everyone just kind of wanted to go in a different direction i don't think they realized how much a lot of fans really love kane i don't think they you know again studio executives you know they're not the ones who watched every friday the movie 50 times you know what i mean so right like oh yeah so you know they're, they're like well 10 different people played him so you know robert england you have to have you can't do it without him but jason doesn't matter as much so yeah that's 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 sad i mean because well I don't know that it affected anything though, really, because yeah, I, for as many people were annoyed that Kane Hodder wasn't coming back, how many of those people actually like boycotted the movie? Like, I'm not yeah. going to go see that movie. Yeah. Everybody wanted to go see this movie yeah. who was a fan of these, these, these films. Well, in the mainstream minds, I mean, you know, I love Kane, but like, he's not a, the average person doesn't know that name. You know, so the people who are just like, oh, you know, I think maybe I saw it on TV once. Favorite Jason. That sounds like fun. They have no idea who Kane Hunter. You know, they, it's not a it's not a box office factor. So yeah, interesting to to think about it though, because Kane's um whole feeling about it, right? As as you wrote Peter in your book, is that um you know this is a, um, a meaningful beloved yeah. 
uh, part of his life and, and also to the fans. I thought the quote that he had um, in the book was really um, fascinating. And, and he said, look, I mean, the only loyal people in this entire business are the fans. I mean, the business is just loyal uh, just by, by nature. And so so the fans are the ones who are, are loyal to you. And, and, and of course, in this case, he found himself on the, the business end of mm -hmm. uh, the, the disloyalty with the movie. But I, I thought the, the story of um, uh, Ken's um, you know, casting in the role and his audition and so forth and what, what was told to Kane versus what was required of Ken in the audition were, were sort of two different things um, in a way. And, and it was interesting that Kane seemed to even have some kind of sour grapes about uh, Ken's involvement with the prior film as we know yeah. and, uh, and so forth. But, but I, I, I guess at the end of the day, like um, I, I appreciate Kane's investment in the role and his commitment to it and so forth. But, but for the average person, like you say, seeing the movie, I think the, the notion of um, Jason Voorhees as a, a uh, six and a half foot tall uh, hulking uh, maniac who in an instantaneous moment slashes somebody. I mean, I think they would be pretty hard pressed to tell the difference between Richard Burker or uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ken Kurtz or, or, and I'm not talking about, you know, our, our friends who go to the conventions and so forth, but, but the average person, because um, as much as Kane has put into it, um, I guess in the last few movies, uh, I don't know that the average person can see the difference really. Yeah, yeah. So, um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and also he had, the, he had the unfortunate distinction of being in the four you know least grossing movies because he was in the later movies. Mm -hmm. so by that point, you know, only the fans were seeing them. Um, yeah, pe all people know is the hockey mask. You know, um, that's it. The, you know, so the other thing too, I was told, and you know, was I sort of get the idea was David and Goliath. Like Freddie is physically smaller, so the bigger Jason is, the more fun the final match would be. You know, because mm -hmm. you know, uh, Freddie's the brains, the puppeteer, and Jason's the brawn. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was also heightening that because, you know, Kane is a little a, a more compact. I don't think, I think he's maybe a little shorter in real life than Robert England. I'm not sure mm -hmm. their exact oh. heights. So, I mean, I, you, oh. could, you could cheat that with things, but, but Kane, I mean, uh, Ken is like six, he's towering. He's, I mean, Kane is not a towering guy. Like he's a big guy, but he's not, you know, you don't look up at Kane really. So, yeah. You know. And that's, you know, the, the weird thing, like the presence of them, like I get the height that Kurt Singer has, and he's obviously a big, yeah. strong guy. But when I think back to like Friday the 13th, uh, the new blood, you know, Kane Hodder's mm -hmm. debut. And I think of the way that he was shot from those low angles or mm -hmm. when he was like the scene where he's coming up out of the water. He, regardless of his height, he just looks kind of like stocky and big. Like he looks like the like a rotting incredible Hulk. I just feel like that would have been, you know, height is one thing, and that's it's yeah. a good signifier. But I feel like if you had had the Kane Hodder Jason up against Freddy Krueger, Freddy would have been a lot more intimidated early on. Uh, I do agree that cornfield burn uh, at the rave was spectacular, though. I would not have I would not have swapped Ken Kurtzinger out for for anybody yeah. in that, and that's impressive because um, I think I was reading that. Uh, a burn like that you can only be on fire for something like 30 yeah. seconds they had to you know get the shots and the the flames yeah. were constantly going out so it took forever to to you know go out but he really wanted to do that even though what was it he was quote as saying uh you know when he got the role he had a stunt man like he was the star not the stunt man <laughs> at that point <laughs> um something like that uh but yeah that scene in particular is the one that I think really sticks out of out of all of them in the films because it's just so weird and interesting and there's so much going around along with that setup. You've got the the Gib character who's out in the field drunk. She's getting you know sexually assaulted by this raver in you know the the glow sticks. When he gets when they get double impaled and he gets flung off into the night, there's just something so cool about these little Christmas tree light glow sticks flying off into the darkness, um, and it's 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 a horrifying scene and kind of a tragic end to, I think one of the most interesting characters in the film who gets short shrift. She's in an abusive relationship. She sees like her boyfriend murdered. She gets raped. She gets stalked in a dream world by a dry, a dream demon and then impaled by his henchmen. Like she just can't cut a break in this whole thing. Um, and then unfortunately I I was thinking about this and how we were going to talk about it. We got to talk about Monica Kina as the final girl. I have never been impressed with her. I like her as an actress. I, she was in Dawson's Creek for like a season. I mm -hmm. thought she was great in that show. But there's just something really vacant about her and 
like uh, almost like a ditzy Marilyn Monroe quality when she's delivering her lines uh, and incredulousness that I couldn't, I just couldn't latch on to. I'm like, she seemed like she was in a different movie. Am I wrong here? Yeah, you know, she did a number of suburbia or something with suburbia in the title before, and she's very like grounded and very different. So it is interesting that that quality came out in Freddy versus Jason because I have seen her other things and she's not that ditzy. So I don't know what happened there. I agree with you, Lee, that she, like that one famous sort of camp line now where she's like, Jason, where she was, Jason's afraid of water. Freddy's afraid of fire. We can use this. And she, the way she delivers it is just so, it's just like, wow, you know, yeah. But she's not, I met her, she's not stupid in, in real life. So I don't know. Yeah. She, that's, um, go ahead, sir. Lee. I think, you know, when I look at a, a girl like her in the movies, um, and, and, I, and this is not to take away from her, her talents mm-hmm. at all. Um, and uh, it's just that it's clear to me that, that you know, you're, you're hiring someone based on their looks um, um, and, and she's great looking um, and she's capable, but she's not um, um, above capable in my view um, in, yeah. in the movie. I think she's just okay. Um, and when you, when you know the stories as you do, uh, both of you do about the auditions being just snap auditions based on how well somebody screamed or, or something like that. Um, so, so when you're, when you're hiring somebody like that for a character, that's not all that well-written uh, anyway, this is what you're, you're going to get. Now, now if we could just shift gears and talk about Kelly Rowland in the movie um, uh, for a minute, uh, I would like <laughs> just because I, I think she's great in the movie. So I want to give a, you know, uh, you know, shout to Kelly Rowland who, who just hadn't acted in a movie before and, and yeah. wanted this role so badly um, and, and um, a lot beat so hard for it. And then she got it, of course. And, and I think yeah. um, every time she's in the movie, she has some kind of spunk about her that I, I really, really like, like right from the, the very beginning of the movie and right to the, the final um, sequence of the movie where, of course, she's um, uh, backing away from Freddie, trying to kind of lure him uh, in a way and, and has that outrageous dialogue that either she made up or, or, or whatever the case is. And, and of course, Robert has his line yeah. too. Um, but there's something about her that's pretty delightful. If you just look at her in the scene, for example, where she's going to do the um, the CPR in the uh, back of the van. I mean, she has a um, comic way about her that's fun, and she's really smart, um, and she has has good instincts. So, so I, I thought she was really um, uh, well used in the movie, and um, I was sorry to see her uh, her go at the end of it. Um, yeah. And I, and I, she has one of the the best moments in the movie too, which is just really funny before you realize. And and if you're smart about these movies, you can catch on pretty quickly mm-hmm. in Nightmare on Elm Street when you're in a dream. Um, you know, you can kind of feel it happening. Uh, but she's got that great line in the movie where she says to, um, you know, it, it's where the um, uh, Lachlan Monroe comes in and, and they're talking about the legend of Jason, a copycat um, a killer at this point. And, and Monica Keene is kind of sitting aside on the sofa and, and um, they begin to talk about her being the virgin in the room or, or something. And, and uh, uh, Kelly Rowland turns to Jason Ritter and says, well, why would you want to you know, fuck her when you could fuck me or whatever the line is. And, and you don't know you're in a dream. You know, you don't know at that moment that you're in a dream. It just sounds like the most outrageous thing yeah. that someone's best friend would say to their boyfriend. Um, and then of course we realize it's a dream a few minutes, a few seconds later, but that's a, a really funny line that she, she has. And I, I thought it was cool. Yeah. That was a great moment because yeah, that blurring of the, of the lines, because right <laughs> after that line, everyone just kind of like turns and looks at Monica Kina. They're like getting up and like, they're getting mm-hmm. ready to, to do something really nasty. Uh, yeah, that was cool. The only problem I had with Kelly Rowland really is that I don't know how old she was when she made this, but these kids, like none of them, re- I think Chris Marquette plays Linderman. It's the only one who looks remotely like he could be in high school. Uh, and yet they're all going to Springwood high. I, I get it's a trope of these movies, but with Kelly Rowland and because she was in destiny's child and all that stuff, I'm thinking like they should have just made this a college movie or something like had these people be a bit older. Uh, cause especially cause Jason Ritter's character, he's supposed to be in high school, right? Isn't yeah. he supposed to be a colleague like the, or not colleague, but a, you know, the same age as Monica Keenick as they used to yeah. go out or whatever. But when he shows up after everything escaped from the institution, I'm like, Oh, so is he like 20? What, <laughs> why is he doing, what's he doing at this high school? He's like 25, yeah. but now he's, he's uh, 17. Um, no, she was good. I, Kelly Rowland. I, I liked the, uh, the fantasy sequence where she's flipping through the magazine because she wants a nose job and Freddie says, got your nose. That's a classic yeah, yeah. Elm Street. It's great stuff. Um, and I think she also had one of the all time great deaths uh, in just any kind of a horror movie. It's not the, the fact of the death because she gets flung against a tree. 
right? Or she gets she gets sliced. I think Jason cuts her a couple of times and slams her, throws her or something. But when she lands and kind of clunks down onto the ground, she's got that vacant like the something in the eyes where it looks like she's actually dead that I feel like is very hard to pull off uh, for especially someone who was a novice mm -hmm. actress. I mean, that was that was eerie. Just yeah. that that one final image of her. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, um, and, and the funny thing is, I, I think, Peter, I, I saw this in your book was that she she was actually terribly afraid of the character of Freddy. Of Freddy. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so she um, wanted to keep her eyes closed on set and so forth. And and um, and I think she managed to, to evoke that she is really uh, a frightened yeah. uh, in the movie. So so I just got a kick out of her. I mean, I, I think um, when we talk about some of the shots in the movie that are are super cool. We'd have to talk about the um, uh, um, uh, steel rods that come down. Uh, of course, one of them is in the climax of the movie, pierces through Jason, and then they they make a kind of a little fortress around him uh, in a way, which is is really cool. I thought that was was great too. I thought that whole sequence with the kind of torpedo esque um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, tanks kind of shooting at him, and this was really well done. Um, yeah. in, in my view, exceeds anything that's kind of been done in in a few uh, movies, and so so I, I thought the movie kept kind of topping itself um, in a way like that. And and I love the kind of flying through the air all the time and everything and the canted mm -hmm. camera angles. And and so I, just, I thought that was cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So all that stuff yeah. came to me. Yeah, I think the movie, the bottom line, it delivers on what it promises. You know, unlike a, a good comparison is Jason Takes Manhattan, where at the end of that movie, you feel let down because Jason doesn't really get to New York. But this movie, you know, whatever you think of the movie, it delivers on that last 20, whatever, five minutes. You get the big battle, you get what you came for. So, um, and fi finding to me, this movie most reminds me of is Nightmare on Elm Street 4 um, for two reasons. One is because that was the most commercial, that was the MTV movie. I don't know if you guys remember when that came out, That's that was the biggest hit of all the Nightmare movies. Because um, that was when like Freddie, he hit his like peak and it was very MTV and glossy. It was made for a general audience. You know, Freddie was more of a fun thing. But also that movie, it's all built around sequences. Like you watch Freddie versus Jason and it's very clear. And the screen, you know, screen, everyone said it. It was like, okay, we got to have you know them do this in this scene. Then we have to have them fight here and here. So all the character stuff is basically just kind of nonsense exposition to get people to the next moment. So it's all plot mechanics, you know. So it's just it's all built around. Oh, it'd be cool, Freddie did this or you know this or that. But like even the stuff like with you know Kelly Rowland her nose and all that stuff doesn't really add up to anything. Like it's it's just there because Freddie has to like, you know, tap into people's fears. So we'll have him do this, this, and this, but it doesn't have any emotional payoff. It's literally just moving chess pieces, you know, on yeah. a board. So, but on that level, it, it delivers and it's fun. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, let, let's, um, when, we, when we talk about emotional uh, payoff and we think about the, the last movie we talked about with the, um, when we were in space and we recreated mm -hmm. through the virtual reality uh, Camp Crystal Lake um, uh, set. I mean, this movie kind of goes one better and I, I really got a kick mm -hmm. out of it. Um, cinematography in the final uh, sequence where we go back to Camp Crystal Lake and we have the um, vision of mm -hmm. Freddy as one of the the camp counselors who was neglecting uh, the the character of Jason. I thought that was was really uh, mm -hmm. kind of a bold visual style in that sequence, and I I thought that was a, a, a really um, the scene preceding that where he's lying there um, as a, a boy with the mask on, um, you know, as Freddy's mm -hmm. kind of leaning over him, and and uh, Paula Shaw I think shows up there too, if I'm not um, mistaken. I thought that was really um, conceptually pretty ambitious to, to create that um, flashback and also the the sunken place, uh, as you want to call it that, although that has other uh, baggage in other movies, but, but that sunken world of all the, the victims underwater and everything, I thought this was um, was pretty imaginative. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's weird. Okay. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was saying, you know, it's, a, it's weird because we're talking about, you know, it's a fun movie, it's well-made, it looks great, it's expensive. But it is, so it's weird that I, you know, I just don't, re, don't really return to it and watch it a lot. You know, it's almost like I appreciate it and respect it more than I enjoy it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think I'm in the same boat. And part of that, I think, has to do with the, like, all the exposition and the kind of, like, the weird C and D plots, like, Monica Kina's character saw his saw her dad murder mm -hmm. the mom or Jason Ritter saw that and there's like this big conspiracy that he got locked up and mm -hmm. it's just there's so much business going on yeah. I almost wish they would have invested more in making it a horror story or just give us more of this like I could have probably watched a 45 minute Freddy versus Jason yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know just yeah. jumping across dreamscapes or something like that uh, you know it, keeping it fun now I wonder 
because this movie ends with a definite, uh, you know, a literal wink at the audience of you don't mm -hmm. know exactly who won. And I, I got to say, going back to Monica Kina real quick, there was an interview in the documentary uh, Crystal Lake Memories where she relates a story uh, about like someone asked her, you know, about who won Freddie or Jason. She says, I won. I'm the one who, you know, <laughs> I'm the one who killed them. <laughs> and it was that kind of like sass and natural like humor that I thought if they had just let her be that in the film, I think she would have been one of the all time mm -hmm. great uh, heroines. Um, but so it's kind of ambiguous. Did, Jason win because he's carrying Freddie's head into the afterlife or did Freddie win because he's, you know, around to wink and, you know, the game will go on. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they made the remake of this thing a few years later. I'm sorry, a remake of Friday the 13th a few years later. And there was talk about Freddie versus Jason versus Ash. But Peter, was there any like serious consideration for doing a sequel to this movie? And can there be a sequel to this film? Where, where do you go from yeah. here? I mean, there, there was internal discussions because it made so much money, but it never got, no, no one was hired to write a screenplay. There was no pitch. It became clear, like, um, that it was better as like a comic book. Um, that was when New Line was starting to kind of get more into books and comic books and ancillary market kind of stuff. Um, so as far as I was told, like, there was never any, like, okay, we're greenlighting a sequel. But they had a few talks, like, oh, it's making money. And then when they realized there's just nowhere to go with this i mean because the problem is i think sean cunningham said it best it's like once you see them fight you know fans aren't going to show up for the reddit freddy versus the, the 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 novelty of it is worn off like it's a one concept one movie concept i think you know yeah um, it's like are oh, they gonna fight again okay, okay. <laughs> hey, hey let's, um, <laughs> let's let's talk for a minute about paula shaw kind of um <laughs> popping into this movie and and trying to fill out some some you know, very big shoes in this film. And, and we talked about um, what uh, Kane Hodder certainly meant to, to fans. We, mm -hmm. we all know um, that we don't have to state what uh, Betsy Palmer mm -hmm. me meant, not just to fans, but to the, the horror uh, genre in general. Um, and of course she turned down, as we know, um, the opportunity to, to be in this movie. But Paula Shaw really, um, I mean, that's a pretty daunting thing to do, uh, to, to step into that role. And, and she kind of makes it her own. I mean, she plays it in a mm, much more diabolical way uh, than, mm -hmm. Uh, Betsy Palmer ever um, played the role and and I thought she was was really tough I mean she mm -hmm. in the film also um and, and I wonder what you guys thought of her and and I don't think there was ever really any pushback to her her playing that role and I've seen her around um as well yeah. people seem to like to talk to her so so I think she was kind of embraced for you know perfectly fine for playing playing mm -hmm. that uh, iconic role yeah, yeah. oh go ahead sorry oh, oh sorry uh, uh I, said, I, mean, I think because the Kane Hodder controversy probably overtook it i think if kane had been cast maybe there might have been more of an outcry or a notice but I, you know um the one difference though i noticed is to me when i watch betsy palmer bet uh, her version of mrs Voorhees, she doesn't realize she's crazy mm. you know, she, so whereas paula shaw is more because paul even told me you know she's playing as freddie's inside her pretending to be mrs Voorhees, so she's not mrs Voorhees, so she's playing freddie so she's all like, you know, you know, <laughs> domineering, you know, because Mrs. Voorhees didn't talk to Jason that way, you know what I mean? So, um, and I, I don't think a lot of people realize that that you know, she she did. She's like, I don't want to play, you know, Betsy's version. That's that's not what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and, and that's that's a great point. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, Betsy Palmer was, you know, she was probably what in her fifties when she did the original Friday the Thirteenth. So you add what 30 years or so I'm, I'm bad at math onto that i just don't think it would have been the same to it would have been nice to have her come back and reprise the role but it in terms of the way jason would have seen her he would have seen his mother as he remembered her i guess being more like in the betsy palmer mold rather than you know betsy palmer 30 years on so i think casting a different actress to play that she had the look i don't know if they got the sweater right because it was more of a red sweater i wonder if that's a play on what you know the freddie aspect yeah. of it right mm -hmm. um but you know it was okay I, I think she did good with the part she was given but you're right peter it is not mrs Voorhees. it's freddie as mrs Voorhees, and that's that's fun yeah. i did like that freddie uh brought back the the severed head i thought that was a really cool prop because it was like a nice mm -hmm. update on the classic mrs Voorhees severed head that we saw in part two mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, you guys, I mean, what, what about the um, uh, French kissing from uh, the father? <laughs> That's a pretty That's wild right. moment. I mean, that really yeah. took the envelope, right? Well, you, we didn't have to bring that up, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I like that they made Freddy TV in again because, you know, he did become kind of commodified and, yeah, you know, it started really Nightmare 3 probably during the so it became just so, you know, he's a James Bond villain and he's doing his little one-liners. But people forget, I mean, he was a child molester. He molested boys and girls in the first movie. And then, um, I don't know if you guys realized, have you ever seen the deleted scenes from the first Nightmare that were on the Laserdisc? I the saw West Craven? I saw one. It was like an extended scene of the Boiler Room conversation. Yeah, because um, Freddie molested Nancy's brother, who yes. got cut out in the final cut. Yeah, and so that it was, was a family relation. So. Oh, and that's the thing is like it was. I think maybe thirty seconds of dialogue because I there was like a an internet article about this a few months ago because I didn't know about this scene until I read it and then they linked it on YouTube. Um, but yeah, there was a whole thing about there were like all these children on Elm Street who had been killed. Many of them were had siblings who were in Nancy's mm -hmm. circle of friends, including in Nancy's house. She had a brother. So that made the a much more personal mm -hmm. stake for Nancy. And I don't know why the hell they didn't leave that in because it yeah. extended the scene. It wasn't even 30 seconds. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah and also killed your brother. I'm like, whoa, mm -hmm. step whoa, back. Yeah. <laughs> well, it also makes sense because like, why would Nancy's mother take the risk to kill Freddie if one of her kids didn't that was the whole point was the vigilantes were all you know the parents of the kids Freddie mm -hmm. murdered why would Nancy's mother you know I wouldn't if some neighbor said oh my kid was killed will you come burn the killer with me I, I wouldn't go <laughs> you know I don't think but it was Mike you know it might be different yeah. we, we hope you never find out yeah, I um, yeah. yeah. come on everyone come on neighbors <laughs> hey, since we're on that subject just and I know Ian we, we have to wrap soon but right. um you know let can we decide what we think about Ronnie Blakely in the first film? I, I, every time I see the movie, I've gone uh, back and forth about her. And I've, I've always thought that somehow she was uh, playing a soap opera melodrama in the middle of a little um, low budget horror film. And, and of course, you know, she was so good in uh, Nashville um, and, and we know she's, she's talented, um, but, but something um, is really off there uh, in the first film, at least for me, I always felt like it was. And, and maybe it's because, um, you know, the character is, not right, um, but something about Ronnie Blakely in that film was always just um, either struck me as just uh, hair shy of camp, or uh, you know hair shy. <laughs> <laughs> Lee is nothing if not diplomatic, yeah. um, <laughs> which you might be watching soon. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's it is one of the great odd performances for sure, and I've always kind of wondered how much of that was her kind of like we were t talking about, you know, with Mrs. Voorhees in this film, how much of Nancy's mom was actually Nancy's mom versus Nancy filtering a dream version of her mother through her own psyche, because how much of the Nightmare Elm Street, the first film was actually in the dream state. Because uh, as we find out at the end, when Freddie has been vanquished and everything, it turns out he actually won because Nancy's been in a dream the whole time. Uh, plus the, you know, she, Mrs. Thompson was a, a raging alcoholic who was also dealing with some severe grief issues. And now the resurgence of this demon who is, she thought that they had all killed. So there's this suppressed guilt. There's all these factors that, yeah, I can see her going crazy. And I liked that Ronnie Blakely played her as a very particular kind of crazy going in a camp direction rather than just, you know, oh, I'm just a maniac, you know, kind of a deal. Yeah, well, I, I think you were going to work some theories in there, Ian. I mean, we, we got some theories, but <laughs> I, but I'll, I'll present them next time. <laughs> Her line where she I'll be said, honest. Well, I, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Peter. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's saying the line where she says, well, well, maybe you don't think murder is serious. I mean, that's that's kind of like her great uh, line that always gets me. I'm going to get her some help. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, I, 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 I don't think she's good in Nashville. I don't think she, I think. You didn't like it's her? One the, okay. So here's a problem. There's certain act where they people think they're playing a part, but really that's just who they are. I, Sandy I don't, Dennis. That's Sandy Dennis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Blake is just sort of this blank, bad line thing. Like she's kind of drunk and dreamy, and that's just how she is. She's not actually acting. So people think, oh my God, Nashville, she's so amazing. Like no, <laughs> she, she's just not really a good actor. So I, she, she's she's just it's just a bad performance in that right on the street. I mean, I, I don't think she was kind of just like I'm going to do camp. I mean, the the orange makeup. I, I don't know if you read the Nightmare on the Street, the Never Sleep Again book. But, you know, she insisted on having this kind of orange makeup on her face. So she looks very 
bronzy. Yeah, it's just like, and that's not, you know, that's someone kind of, I guess, who's insecure about their, I don't know. So I, I, I'm sorry, sorry, Ronnie Blakely, if you're watching this, but I, I just think it's a bad camp performance. It's, there's no way around it. You know, I would love to say it was conscious decision, but I Well, know. and I will go to the ends of the earth to justify anything so you you may be absolutely <laughs> right so i could be totally wrong it's, you know, it's a, um, what people forget like even donald pleasant's got out and he got really he got pretty hammy and yeah. he was great in halloween and then it became more and more of a character like you watch you know part six and well, don't you guys always wonder though like well, why did they pull him back why didn't they tell him you don't have to say i shot him six times six times <laughs> play it twice i mean twice is enough um so I, uh, why pull, i don't know why they don't pull them back like i mean because yeah. <laughs> well, he's that the point, worst he's... doctor in history yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> well because that at that point it's you know he's donald pleasance like you know there's, there's certain people like maybe you just don't yeah. you know he's where he's carrying the back of this thing or you know it's all on his shoulders i don't know well guys i gotta i gotta jump <laughs> unfortunately but okay. the good news is we got through a great kind of truncated conversation about freddie versus jason yeah. uh with no mudslinging no fighting uh this is <laughs> this is good um and we are going to be back next month to talk about Friday the 13th, the 2009 version, which interestingly enough, I know it was covered in the Crystal Lake Memories documentary, but it was because the film came out years after the book was published. We haven't gotten to get, you know, Peter's real like insights and, and <laughs> thoughts on that film. So you, you're gracious enough to, to talk with us again yes. next month. Looking forward to that. And uh yeah. So anybody out there in YouTube land or on the podcast, if you have any questions, you can put them in the uh, in the, the comments here and maybe we can tackle them next month. So uh, yeah. until then, it, I don't want to have that last word here, guys. Do you have any closing thoughts on on Freddie versus Jason? I think you ought to invite Ronnie Blakely to next month. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a, uh, we should, you should talk to the Never, the Never Sleep Again doc people about why she's not in it and they'll tell you more about Ryan Blakely. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very telling that I gave you a chance to give final words on Freddy versus Jason. We went to, went to talking about <laughs> Ronnie Blakely again. Blakely did. Kelly Rowland. Uh, Kelly Rowland. Yeah, I, there you go. Yeah, Kelly Rowland, MVP. Yeah. It's a well-made movie. It delivered on the bottom line. You know, it made a lot of money. It resuscitated Friday Teen, so I'm really grateful for it. You know, like, like the book, it was a really nice, I mean, read the book, it like, was like, oh, wow. You know, the last chapter of the movie's this franchise a hit again it's back in the consciousness it brought jason back to a whole new audience so gotta give it props for that yeah yeah well and i am i'm appreciative for you guys so again thank you very much for your time and, and investment and and dusting off freddy versus jason i can't believe <laughs> lee you watched this thing three times in the last few days and you hadn't seen wow. it except for once in the last 15 years or whatever you be told i watched commentary once straight and then once on 1.5 times speed <laughs> So. <laughs> and that's, how, that's nice. how you do it all right gentlemen thank you very much uh good night and i'll catch you in a month all right see you later guys all right bye, <laughs> bye.